Good morning. Over the past several years, I've written a lot of short stories. Some are good, some are not so good. I've written enough that I would consider myself an amateur writer. However, I have never accomplished that same degree of expertise in reading. I'm not even an amateur reader. Therefore, today, you may hear some slurred words, some skipped words. We may even have to repeat a sentence or two. But just remember, if I were telling you the story, that's the way it would be. Today, the title of the story is Travel. Travel comes from Bogachitta Flats, and I think it's either the first or second story in the entire book. Uh, it's one of my more requested. Uh, it's one that reflects on the 1950s and growing up in South Mississippi. So, let's begin. Travel. Bessie Burns pulled herself onto her porch as much with her arms and the railing on the steps as she did with the strength in her legs. She was worn out, tired but pleased to know the last of her cotton was in and the turnips were out of the ground. She sunk into a platform rocker that no longer rocked. It just squeaked. The porch slanted to her left and her body leaned that way, but she didn't notice. The porch had partially caved in 10 years prior. Bessie had never owned a new dress or owned a new pair of shoes. She had never traveled more than 10 miles north or farther south than the bootlegger. She went there once to buy whiskey with her husband, Leon. That's back when he was a drinker, but he's dead now. He died last fall just after the crop was in. Bessie was a sharecropper and she and Leon had worked on the Johnson place for 45 years. She did not pity herself. She knew she was better off than the white sharecropper that lived across the field. He and his family, they was lazy. Ain't no place for lazy white men, she would say especially if he'd be poor. She knew what she would have for supper. Tiber milk and cornbread left over from yesterday. First, however, she just wanted to rest. She needed to rest more often now. When she did rest, she thought about the past. She thought about Silas. That was her son, her only surviving son. One son, the oldest, died when he was an infant. The other drowned in the pond near the house when he was eight years old. Silas was grown now and he'd moved to Chicago where he had a job with the Illinois Central Railroad. He was a poor porter. She was proud of him, but she missed him. She missed him helping out with the crops, but her pride came from the fact that she was making, or he was making a better life for himself. He wouldn't have to work like a slave on a white man's place. Silas told her she could ride that train free anywhere, anytime she wanted to, but she had never wanted to go anywhere. Once when she was a child, she told her mother she felt like she was a slave. Her mother told her to never say that again. Things might be bad, but she was free. Free to starve anywhere she wanted to, and that's worth something. She wasn't worrying about next year's crop as she, was normally would have, as she normally would have. Her outlook was somehow different now. She had not been to a doctor, never had been to a doctor, but she had that burning in her belly. That's the same symptoms her mother had, and she died six months after they appeared. Bessie dozed off and her head nodded down to her chest that was covered by a threadbare blouse. After a while, she would get up, draw some water from the well, wash up and fix her supper. She was aroused when the car came to a stop just inches from the front porch. The dust rolled in in layers. It was Mrs. Johnson. Mrs. Johnson waited in the car till the dust settled and then motioned for Bessie to come to her. Bessie, come on up to the house. I've got something I want to talk to you about. Yasum, Miss Johnson. Ms. Johnson left with the same haste in which she had arrived, and Bessie retreated inside. Damn, she thought. Then she said out loud, forgive me, Lowell. 
She knew Mrs. Johnson did not want to talk about anything. She just knew the real reason was to have her to do some chore that could have as well wait until in the morning. Bessie wanted to tell her, I ain't no slave. All I got to do is farm my plot. But she knew better. She had said that once when Leon was alive. Mrs. Johnson told her she had 10 families that wanted that house, and any one of them could make a better crop than she and Leon. Anyway, after Mr. Johnson died and Leon died, they had developed a degree of respect for each other. She cleaned up and walked a half mile to the big house. Mrs. Johnson was on the porch, and it was well after sundown. On her table by her side was a pitcher of lemonade and two glasses. Beside that was another chair. Bessie knew without asking that Mrs. Johnson was expecting company, and she now knew that she wanted her to come and cook something to serve. Yassum, you want me to make an apple pie or one of them eggs pies like I make, is that right? Neither one, Bessie. I want you to sit down. Miss Johnson poured her glass of lemonade and Bessie to see cautiously took a seat. She had never been invited to do that in 45 years. It must have been five minutes and neither one spoke one word to each other. Finally, Bessie said, Miss Johnson, what be on your mind? Bessie, I've been thinking, you're getting old, too old to do field work, and I'm getting old too too old to keep up this big house. I want you to come and live with me. You cook and clean, and I'll pay you a little. Now mind you, just pay you a little. You won't have to work the fields anymore. You can use the bathroom behind the house. It has running water, and I'll put heat and hot water in there for you. Bessie didn't answer, but considered the proposal if she were about to sign a note to buy the entire farm. Finally, she said, Ms. Johnson, I'll let you know in the morning. It was one of the worst nights Bessie ever spent. Not as bad as the night her son died, not as bad as the night Leon died, and not as bad as the night before Silas left home, but it was bad. The next morning, just after daylight, she knocked on her landlord's door. She had her suitcase and in her hand, there was most of the possessions that she owned. No, ma'am, I can't do it. I go and try. Mrs. Johnson's mouth dropped wide open and she did not reply. She just watched Bessie as she ambled down the dirt road toward town, around the curve and out of sight. The next year in mid-fall, Mrs. Johnson got a telegram. Mrs. Johnson, Mama wants to come home. Please meet the train. It's the Panama Limited, and it should arrive about 9.30 on Wednesday morning. Thank you, Silas Burns. Mrs. Johnson did meet the train, and both of the women expressed an outward pleasure of seeing each other. But after the greeting, not much was said on the ride home. Finally, Mrs. Johnson said, Well, Bessie, how was traveling? Oh, it'd be all right, I guess. I saw Chicago and that big pond they call Lake Michigan, but I'm ready to come home. I miss being near Leon and where my children be raised. Bessie, I got the hot water and the heat put in that bathroom. I think you'll find a nice, comfortable place to stay at my house. No, Miss Johnson, I wants to go home, my home. Is it still vacant? Oh yes, Bessie, it's vacant. It's just like you left it. You can't find any sharecroppers anymore. Everyone wants wages now. I have to pay all my hands one dollar a day plus lunch. It takes all the profit out of farming. Bessie thought a minute. That's a lot of money. I bet it do. I'll take you to your home, Bessie, if that's what you wish. Yes, sir. The next week, Bessie passed away, and she was buried next to Leon and her two sons.